We uh, hope that everyone is coping with lockdown, but we are delighted that you can join us tonight to discuss the impact that deals and disinformation have on our democracy. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet tonight. I'm on the land of the Kamaregal people of the Aurora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. North Sydney Conversations is run by volunteers and not affiliated with a political party. We want to give people in the North Sydney electorate the opportunity to be part of meaningful discussion with experts about issues that matter, like integrity in government and climate change. And we also want to help people connect with other like-minded locals. There will be an opportunity to ask questions throughout the evening. Please post them in the chat function at the bottom of the screen. And at the conclusion of the discussion, there will be an opportunity to stay on for chat roulette if you wish. We'll allocate people randomly into breakout rooms of four to continue the conversation. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce our three wonderful guests. Marion Wilkinson is one of Australia's most renowned investigative journalists. She has covered politics, national security, refugee issues and climate change, as well as serving as a foreign correspondent in Washington DC for the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. She was a deputy editor of the Sydney Morning Herald, executive producer of the ABC's Four Corners program and a senior reporter with Four Corners. She has won many awards and in 2018 was inducted into the Australian Media Hall of Fame. Her latest book, The Carbon Club, forensically investigates the network behind Australia's bitter political battles over climate change. It is a captivating read. Craig Rukasel, yeah, Craig's holding it up. It really is, it's an amazing book. Craig um, Rukasel is a director, writer, comedian, and broadcaster. He is best known for The Chaser, the multi-award winning ABC TV series, War on Waste, as well as the ABC documentary series, Fight for Planet A and Big Weather. This year, Craig put on the director's hat and helped create the documentary, Big Deal is Our Democracy for Sale which will be released next month. The film explores how money and the non-transparent influence of corporate lobbying has led to increasing disillusionment with the democratic process. It aims to build pathways for greater democratic engagement and advocacy for a fairer democracy. And our moderator tonight is our local Catherine Fox. She is a leading commentator on women and the workforce, an award-winning journalist, author, and presenter. Catherine had a long career at the Financial Review. She has published many books, including Stop Fixing Women, which along with her journalism was awarded the 2017 Walkley Award for Women's Leadership in Media. So I will now hand over to you, Catherine, to moderate tonight's conversation. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Trine, Susie, Johnny, and the team for the work that you're doing. It's, it's fantastic, um, so congratulations. Um, it's fantastic to be here um, in the middle of um, one existential crisis and to be <laughs> discussing another one. Um, however, we do want to be really clear about tonight, while it, of course, deals with a topic that's deeply serious, um, we do hope that you, you actually find this a quite sort of uplifting and energising conversation as well about participating uh, in our democracy because, boy, uh, we need to. Um, so fantastic to have uh, Craig and Marion here. And I do agree, uh, Carbon Club's an extraordinary read. Um, Marion, and such an enormous amount of work as someone who's written the odd book, you, you sort of keep going, wow, this is just um, extraordinary. Marion, can I um, ask you, it is extraordinary to look back over about 20 years, I guess, at um, how a relatively small cohort of climate sceptics, uh, certainly in politics, but also some in the business community, um, and some sort of from think tanks uh, from here and the US indeed, had such a massive impact on derailing uh, the potential for some action on climate change. Why were they so successful, do you think? I think the simple answer to that, Catherine, is that what they were doing actually really helped some very powerful big businesses in Australia and globally. Had these just been like today with Craig Kelly banging on with his anti-vaxxer message, he wouldn't have got that far. But when you look at the people that they were aligning themselves with, the people who, for example, were putting money 
into some of these disinformation campaigns. You had everyone from, you know, ExxonMobil to, in the early days, even companies like BHP supporting some of these skeptic groups. Now, of course, uh, that's changed, but I think what hasn't changed, and I think Craig has looked at this, certainly he did in the fight for Planet A, and I think it's probably going to be in his latest documentary too, what I do find interesting is that a lot of these interests, while they're now uh, moving to some extent away from the skeptic view, what they haven't signed up to is a realistic view of what we have to do. And a lot of the money and a lot of the lobbying is now going into delay, delay, delay our move to a clean energy economy. And they're using uh, their political influence, they're lobbying like hell, and they get a lot of very important media people on side when they do it. Mm. Yes, and I think you point out right at the end of the book that um, Scott Morrison himself is now using that very rather effective um, sort of stance, which John Howard, in fact, had as well, which we, we accept the science, we, we, we know the science is there, but we don't have, you know, the options or the plan in front of us. So, yes, that's, that's very true. Um, Craig, tell me about um, how you've dealt with um, the climate sceptics and climate scepticism and what impact you've, you've seen that having in some of the work that you've been doing. Yeah, it's interesting. I think the debate has changed from the period that Marion probably looked at in the Carbon Club and more recently now. You do see nowadays that you're less likely to see somebody who say climate change isn't real. Yeah. And if you look at polling, it's, it tends to be about 8% of people are really climate sceptics as such. <clears throat> but <clears throat> the debate has become a lot harder to put down, you know, comes to, to deal with, because that is now what we're now seeing is that it is about delay. It's about climate delay. It's about saying we understand, we agree with the science, but We've got to be slow about this. So we've got to have a gas-fired recovery or something like that. So it is a real problem because it's become, in some ways, harder to deal with. I mean, I do think that a lot of climate scepticism was really a kind of intellectual loincloth over the kind of naked power and money that was underneath it. Really. Like it was that you can't... The interesting thing when you look at money in politics, and I don't just look at climate, we look at lots of different issues in this documentary. No politician will ever admit they're affected by this in any way. There's no impact at all on them, of course. Um, so the role of lobbyists and groups like that is to come up with the arguments to make it feel like, no, 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 I'm not influenced by the donations that's been given by that company. I'm influenced by this wonderful argument that convinces me that we need to, you know, put more money into gas or something like that. It's a, you know, it's an intellectual loincloth essentially. And so, climate scepticism itself was just that. It was a way to try and muddy up the debate. And it's fascinating when you look at like somebody like Frank Luntz, Luntz, who was the kind of Republican Party spin doctor who came up with a lot of the anti-climate change stuff. And who, of course, has since, he's since, he's now believes climate change is real because his house nearly burnt down. But um, if only every climate denier's house nearly burnt down would be fine. But what he was doing when he was looking into this, he was never actually analysing the science or questioning. He was basically trying to take lines and analyse how we as people responded to them and just go, which argument most beneficially pushes people away from climate science? So, yeah, look, climate skepticism, skepticism is a big was a big problem, but it's become less so now. It's kind of a different, it's a different beast at the moment, I'd say. Mm -hmm. mm. I'm not going to get that um, idea of the loincloth out of my head. I can I <laughs> good, uh, good. In, immediately. <laughs> um, I just wanted to, uh, well, Craig, why don't you tell us a bit about Big Deal? Um, why you've made it and a little bit more about it because it, it's yeah. fascinating. Well, look, I've always been interested in money and politics, but never really got a chance to deal with it substantially. And when I was making climate docos like Big Weather and Fight for Planet A, I often found that it was, you'd hit a certain barrier where I guess the, the policy or the way we were going just didn't make sense. And it didn't make sense unless you kind of looked beyond what was being said on top. You looked, I guess, underneath to that kind of, um, donations to the influence and all these kind of things. It's not just donations. It's a much more complex beast, really. Um, I didn't really get to cover them in those documentaries, but I was very lucky to kind of go to a, a writer's workshop to where Jungle and Tame were looking at this issue. And through a you know, series of discussions, we kind of got to the point where I always, I, I'm directing this. I'm not actually in this movie. It's great. I'm behind the camera. 
uh, with this kind of lockdown here, it would be great if I was behind a camera. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, it's about that. And it follows Christian Van Buren, who is a, you people might know him from the Bondi Hipsters, kind of comedian who looks into this issue. And I guess you see it from the perspective of somebody who's not a political expert, which is great, because it's interesting how sometimes even I've become too cynical, I think, and respond to things as, well, that's the way it always is. But when you then see it through somebody's eyes who's coming to it for the first time and they're like, absolutely shocked by it it's it's really great so yeah it follows christian on a journey looking into money and influence in australia and it's um it's a kind of story that is really kind of depressing in the first half it becomes surprisingly uplifting at the end where we start to look at kind of solutions and ways in which new democratic movements and uh, people are fighting back against that so um yeah it's a fascinating journey to go on Okay, and people can see it. When is it? Next month? Is it? It comes out as a movie next month. Um, yep. Yes. Look, uh, <laughs> <laughs> big deal is the name of it. Look, obviously, in, in the lockdown states, it's a bit harder to see at the moment, but there will be some viewings, and communities can actually kind of say, we want to get together and all watch it. So, North City Conversations, for instance, you know, active communities like this. So, okay. look, uh, I'll get back to you on that. It's a okay, bit of all right. Well, we'll take that time to be releasing a movie, hey? Oh, no, well, yes, indeed. So we'll take that one on notice. Um, but I'm sure people will be asking you or us anyway. Um, so, Marion, when when you mentioned before, you know that that companies have changed, and I was struck by um, the part of your book where you mentioned the uh, BHP. Um, opting out of the Minerals Council and things like that happening. And that's certainly certainly a shift. But we've also um, rather consistently, in fact, on the other hand, we've seen over the years, and there was a mention um, during the Howard years, for example, polling by the Lowy Institute found 68% of people actually did believe in climate change, wanted action on it, uh, despite the expense of it. Um, we've always had quite high levels of people who say, yes, climate change, not only real, uh, but absolutely needs to be acted on. Why this big gulf then that we still have right now? Um, so, yes, you've covered the machinations and so on. Why is this uh, sentiment from voters not actually galvanising? Because, in fact, that's sort of the nub of what we're discussing tonight, isn't it? What, what does this say about our democracy um, and why hasn't it shifted? Uh, well, I think, um, you, you know, you mentioned BHB before they yeah. didn't quite they didn't in the end leave the minerals no, council they, they um yeah. yes yeah. they did have a big right. say about it and then decided it was better to stay with the strength and you know argue from within i think this is almost symbolic of the problem about the climate issue in australia it has been a second order issue for the major parties. So they know people care about it and especially uh, people in the major cities care about it, but they feel like it's a second order issue. And so they don't have to actually look at whether people's, people will vote just on that issue. And I think the really interesting thing for me at the moment is this decade, I believe, will change that. And I think the message that is finally coming through, and we saw it in the IPCC report um, just a few weeks ago, and we hear it a lot now from European leaders and from people like Joe Biden and John Kerry, is that if we don't change this decade, then essentially we're gonna lose this battle. Now, I know scientists have been saying that for a long time, but now very, very credible political leaders are saying it. And I think that is really shifting the mood in Australia. And if you put that together with some of the experiences we've had here, not the least being the black summer bushfires and watching what is happening with whole swathes of California, Alaska, Siberia, uh, you know, burning uh, hundreds of millions of acres uh, uh, of forest. I think that people are really beginning to see with their own eyes the impact of what's going on. And that's why I think these warnings of it's this decade, it's now, will finally start moving people's vote as a first order issue, not a second order issue. 
Yeah. And and tell me, uh, thinking about other um, sort of levers, I guess, Anthony Wheelie from the Centre for Public Integrity in, a, in one of these conversations mentioned that capping political donations uh, might be a step in the right direction, maybe uh, could be an important circuit breaker. Um, uh, Craig, is that something that should be looked at? Yeah, definitely. I think it's one of the steps. There's so many steps here. I mean, this is the thing is, if you think about you know, a gas company already has a massive advantage in terms of government from both Labor and Liberal side, if they're saying we're going to put money and create jobs, that kind of stuff. It's already a huge advantage. If you then put another thing and say, well, you've donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to both parties. You also have important people in key offices. You also have, the, it's not only the money. I mean, you, there's a real carrot and stick here. Because part of it is the kind of, we'll donate to you and do this. The other part is the threat that happens behind the scenes. And actually, I mean, Marianne shows this kind of stuff in her book. But it's it's that threat of, we'll run a campaign against you. We'll use our money against you as well. So it's a complex thing to actually kind of, it's a bit of a whack-a-mole situation. We need a cap on donations so there's not a disproportionate effect, you know, between people. Like, you know, you can't have somebody who's your Clive Palmer with, you know, $80 million or something. You can't have, you know, we, the whole idea of democracy is, one person, one vote. But when it comes to donations, I'm very unlikely to be able to compete against a big company. Um, so <clears throat> we need to have the cap there as well. And by the way, can I just point out, this is not a business matching thing. An enormous amount of companies would support this as well. In a lot of cases, this is not companies going to politicians and going, hey, do you want some money? And listen to me. A lot of cases, it's the directors of the parties, it's the Sam Bastiaris out there, who's in this movie and is very frank, going to them and basically shaking them down. So it's not to say the business is not going to support this as well. So you need to cap on donations. You also need to cap on spending, though. It's interesting that both Sam Bastiari and Malcolm Turnbull in the movie both use the term, this is an arms race. It's an arms race between the two parties. So you need, if you cap the spending, how much they can spend, it stops that arms race. It stops them needing to go after more and more money to compete against each other. And we did bring in public funding in Australia. We brought in public funding, but we then we didn't restrict the kind of other forms of donations. And unfortunately, there's been some high court cases which have undermined the laws that I would ideally bring in. But there has still been some positive steps in the right direction. We've seen in a lot of states, for instance, much greater transparency in Queensland nowadays. If a minister has a meeting with somebody from Santos to that, they will have to record that. And that's part of this is getting greater transparency. One of the things in the movie I think shocked us all was that um, Australia has worse transparency on this than in America. You just go, you know, you just go, it's ridiculous that we're worse than America at money and politics, or, or particularly at least on the transparency side of it. So there are so many different aspects that need to be fixed here. Um, cap on donations is one of them, but it's a really complex piece. The, the revolving door as well between you know, government and private sector as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Marion, any other, uh, well, I'm sure there are many other, any other particular areas around transparency um, and certainly leading to more accountability that um, you think are worth <laughs> mentioning? Well, I honestly think that one of the things that uh, re really does need to happen in Australian politics and, uh, and um, I would cheer the uh, person who tried to push this in, in our parliament in a private member's bill is that we do need a radical overhaul of the political donation transparency rules. Mm -hmm. And I think the absolute key to this is uh, what Craig mentioned before. It's not just the donations, it's a cap on the spending yeah. because as we all know, you put in a donation law and some party chief will find their way around it or their lawyers will. But I think this cap on spending is absolutely crucial. And then there's the really tough thing, which a lot of um, community groups even don't really want or like, but I think they'll have to find a way to live with, is it is also a cap on people in the community spending on on political advertising, because otherwise what you're gonna get is a whole lot of people who are really supporting Woodside or Santos or whatever, setting up community groups all the way through the mining districts and plowing money into them to saturate regional media with political advertising. So 
that's where, of course, you run up against those high court decisions that Craig was mm. talking about. But I think somehow it's got to come down to the amount of spending during the election. But I th also think the transparency issue is key. It makes a big difference if people have to report their donations and the meetings with lobbyists in real time, i.e. you can't do this a year later at the end of the cycle when everyone's forgotten what the issue is. You have to do it, you know, within weeks. And I think that would be critical too. That, that, that's the key. I mean, you look at Marion's book, it's amazing the kind of level of depth there. But of course, you couldn't have done a lot of that at the time because the information is not there. And you want journalists like Marion to be able to say, this week I saw where the donations came from, where they went to, what were the meetings that were held. And in the movie, we kind of, we plot the meetings and donations and decisions and that, for instance, to go to a company was, you know, Santos, for instance, and it's just extraordinary to see it there. So it needs to be there exactly, directly known at the time. At the time, yeah. Um, certainly as a journalist, I think that would be, <laughs> that would be excellent. Um, <laughs> very difficult to get that kind of information. Um, I just wanted to ask you, we often hear that we're very cynical about politics and, and you know, rightly so. Um, and then we hear that, you know, we're more cynical, that, that, that things have deteriorated, I guess, over time, trust levels and so on. And I sometimes think perhaps we exaggerate that, perhaps our memories are a little rusty about what actually did occur. But I must say, a line in the sand for me was last year when the Premier of New South Wales, after that inquiry into whether there'd been pork barrelling in the lead up to the last state election and indeed the inquiry found yes that that was indeed the case she said something and I'm not quoting her here paraphrasing something like that happens in politics uh it happens right across politics yes she's right but it happens and look the electorate don't like it but that's the way it is I, I felt for me something really shifted then when I heard that so frankly um, laid out. What, do, what does that tell us, in fact, about, I guess, standards and values uh, within our uh, political system? That was, that was, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say something it, like it was, that. It was appalling. It was funny, you were like, partly complimentary going, wow, you're just quite truthful about that, weren't you? I know. There's this <laughs> frankness like, about it that you think is just, yeah. what is and, that and I yeah, the, the, we don't cover that in the movie because one of the things about this movie was that this looks at kind of money and influence and that kind of element of it. There are so many other elements of kind of political corruption and wrong that kept coming up during this period. We were filming going, we can't deal with it all. There's just too much. <laughs> it's just like so much of it. But it's interesting. One of the bits that really, um, it, when we were filming the movie, uh, we spoke to a guy called David Barrow from the Sydney Alliance. He's a kind of community campaigner. And it was a really fascinating moment for Christian and me for behind the camera as well because he it was a kind of moment that changed our perception you just go to that kind of cynicism and he said you know politicians want you to feel like politics is dirty and that it's all blackmail and bribery don't get involved leave it to the professionals that's what they want you to think so they've succeeded if they make you feel cynical and overwhelmed so just that really fascinating it's kind of going oh yeah so it's easier for them if we think oh politics is all corrupt and I'm not going to get involved in that it actually becomes easier for those who are you know in there being corrupt and again it's, it comes back to things like in the same way that business is not you know this 100% each way on this there's all different perspectives politicians are not 100% each way in every political party labor liberal independence and that there are people in each party who would love to tighten this up who hate these rules who hate that this has an influence on their party who hate having to fight against that in their party. So there are good people in all parties that want to change this. And so by us kind of accepting that, being cynical and accepting that that's the way it's always going to be, doesn't help them. It actually helps those that are the ones that we hate, essentially. So yeah, it's about being cynical enough to become active, but actually becoming active as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. not letting that put you off. Um, we should talk, um, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the time, but but um, I was going to say quickly about the role of media. Um, it's a big mm. topic. But Marion, um, what what um, what are the trends in media that you see as troubling? I was watching Four Corners on Monday night um, and was just staggered all over again by the Fox uh, in the US and their, their collaboration uh, with uh, the Trump campaign and indeed the election of President Trump and so on. Um, and sort of thinking, and it's funny, Craig, you should mention that lack of transparency in this country compared to the US. I was sort of thinking, well, thank heavens, 
uh, we're not quite there. But but actually, media concentration in this country is deeply troubling. Um, so where are we with with media um, and and the effect that the incredibly intrinsic um, nature of it in, in our democratic system? But are we in a healthy place, healthier, or where are we, Marion? I think we're in a slightly more healthy place than we were a few years ago. There was a terrible time, I think, in the media, at least from the reporting on climate change from that point of view, certainly when I was uh, at the ABC at Four Corners just um, in the last decade, where at the height of the Abbott government, for example, when there was so much scepticism about climate change in the media and there was a feeling that basically anyone who came out with climate change arguments in the media was green or uh, was an unrealistic uh, you know, business wrecker and a wrecker of jobs. That atmosphere flowed from uh, not only the Murdoch media, but many senior journalists, I believe, in the press gallery. And at the ABC, I think it had a terrible effect because there was a real feeling that you had to pull your punches all the time. People would question you all the time if you wanted to do a very strong piece on climate change. And so I think that this is what we have to watch out for, not only with, for example, you know, some of the lines that the Murdoch media take, but the incredible impact that has on other media for example, what they, you know, as an insider, how it works is if the Oz splashes on something that, you know, that morning, you can guarantee that three or four ABC radio hosts will pick up and run with it in various states around the country. You can guarantee commercial media will run with it. And that view then becomes the view for the day. And if it's a view that, for example, you know, that the Santos Narrabri project will bring X number of jobs and anyone who opposes it, you know, is basically just a job wrecking greenie, that will get a good run all day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to, well, Craig, with, with the work that you've done, um, I just think you've been so clever in taking that um, sort of the satirical, uh, comedic sort of stance around some of these incredibly um, difficult, challenging, and actually sort of off-putting issues. I think that that access into how we can actually help what we can do, um, and the war on waste was such a, a great example of that. They're quite redemptive. And I just wondered, what what is your message through this? Because um, <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't seen Big Deal, but I mean, your point is very much about individuals being able to contribute. Well, just... Look, it's, it's, it's interesting because I'm always extremely cautious. The first thing is that that, that it, it's great that we have come a, lot, a little bit of we've come away in terms of the ABC that like there was no question that I was ever going to do a climate change documentary where part of it was like is climate change real? Not willing to have that conversation. I'm starting with the fact that it's real and we're talking about what we can do about it. I think that we do look at what you can do as an individual, but it's extremely important that as part of that was that we didn't then say. It's just about what you can do as an individual. Like the reason yeah. I took tons of trees into the head office of Chevron in Perth was because they have a much bigger impact. They can make a much bigger change in that case. So it's about the individual is important because um, if one of the things I think it actually changed my concept of politics. Like I, you know, studied you know, politics at university and that kind of thing. And I think when I came into war and waste, I had a very old fashioned perspective of power and it was like you know well you go to the politician and ask them to change the laws and that's what fixes it what I actually saw after war and waste was that community individuals and communities actually changed a lot quicker and when they changed that had a kind of flow and effect to business who was business was far more responsive as well business can change quicker than government and that and then that had a flow and effect actually towards changing policy in different government levels and that's because and I've had several politicians say to this this to me we don't lead we follow so one of the reasons that these kind of conversations that are happening in the community is so important is that if, you, if politicians start to see that people are talking about accountability and all this kind of issues that's when they'll actually respond to it it's not just going to be led by them necessarily so um yeah so i guess my 
I don't have one single <laughs> message. I mean, I think with climate change, it's a, it's a mixture of hope because there are so many things we can do now, but also utter frustration at how slowly we're dealing with it. And that's why this issue about big deal and money in politics is part of that story because that's part of the reason we're being so fundamentally slow with it. It's, you know, it's, it is a really complex beast. And it's, you know, with all of these topics, and Marion will know this is you just, you go between hope and total absolute frustration, I think. So I don't have one, I don't have not only one message, I don't even have one mood. When it comes to That's a topics. perfect way to describe yeah, the mood, I yeah. think. Yeah. <laughs> well, as someone. It can be very depressing. As someone who's very immersed in looking at uh, women and women's mm -hmm. rights, I absolutely hear you. Yeah. <laughs> that one. Um, yeah. Marion, tell me about uh, what are the practical steps that you recommend uh, for people who perhaps have read, you know, the Carbon Club mm -hmm. and are sort of throwing their hands up in despair. But there, mm -hmm. but there, but there are things that we can start to consider. Uh, oh, I think there are very practical things, and I think particularly at this point in time, almost, I think. Uh, compared to the past where I have covered these issues basically for the last 15 odd years. Mm -hmm. I think at the moment, people's voices on this are far more influential than they have been for a long time. I think what is really crucial to understand is that your voice in your local area does make a big difference now because we're living in a political world where the parties are so finely balanced, whether it's in the federal parliament, whether it's a state parliament in New South Wales, for example. And God, do you know that in North Sydney, you know, that politics are very finely balanced. And if enough people say, this is my number one issue, then it does have an impact. And, you know, really demanding to know what uh, that particular local politician is going to do within their party forum and within, you know, the party room on these issues, you know, really pin them down. I think that's one thing. And the other area that I think we can't underestimate, uh, especially, again, for this kind of audience is the influence you can have with your superannuation fund and your bank. Because right now, that, that question of their sensitivity uh, to the climate issue, both from the investor point of view and from the client, customer point of view, uh, is getting more and more crucial. And as Craig said, I think the war on waste was a really good example of this, where we finally saw the communities move, but then the big companies having to move as well. And I think that's the case with the climate issue, because, you know, you're seeing right now investors beginning to walk away from very, uh, from companies that will not shift their policies in a realistic sense. And I think as that happens, the superannuation uh, companies in particular, the superannuation funds in particular, but also the banks are just going to be more and more uh, aware of this. And I think the voices of, of customers and the voices of superannuation members is really going to ha have an impact. Mm. Yeah, it, it's a very powerful thing. I agree. Um, now, I'm going to um, just have a look through the questions here because we have got a few. Uh, so there's one here. Um, is there a model of transparency legislation uh, in another jurisdiction that we could look at in, in terms of the donations and the spending that we were discussing earlier? So is there anything that um, is a good template? Yeah, the wouldn't We looked at um, Ireland as interesting as a country. I mean, there's, there's a few countries that have tried to deal with this. Canada has as well. There's some interesting stuff in South Korea. But Ireland's an interesting one because they they were kind of like us. They, I don't know if this rings a bell for anyone here, but they were kind of really a lot of politicians very much in bed with property developers, mm -hmm. and that led to problems during the global financial crisis in Ireland. And they <laughs> tightened up their legislation a lot. They made uh, you know you had to know who was lobbying who for what reason. There were limits on spending. There were caps on donations. There were all of this kind of stuff, and that seems to have had an effect. Now, it's not perfect. There is no perfect system in anywhere in the world. This hasn't been uh, dealt with. But, yeah, Ireland's a good example of where they've made some good changes and responded to the kind of problems that I think we uh, feel here in Australia a bit. When did they make those changes, Craig? 
Oh, you're putting me on the spot here. I feel like it might have been 2012-ish, but I'm, don't quote me on that. So, so not, you have not to... really recently, a few years back. No, I was just no, like, no, a few years back. Yeah, yeah no, a few years back. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. so there's there's some positive changes there. Canada also made some similar changes. So it tends to be it's not one rule; it's a raft of changes. And obviously, part of the debate here is us having a kind of federal corruption commission, which can actually oversee it as well. Because one of the problems is that we do have some rules there, but they're not policed in any way. It's just like utterly ridiculous. I mean, if you, there's supposedly rules about what you do after you're a minister and what you know you can go into and lobbying, but as far as I can tell, it's not particularly held to. Okay. Mm. Don't want to mention any names. <laughs> no, maybe best not to at this stage. Um, and then someone else has also said um, if we were able to to get this through, if the if the major parties, you know, supported it or or indeed let it through, maybe is a better way of putting it. Um, yeah, how can we help to affect that change? So I suppose that's the old, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's the I guess the point is one one part of this movie is we kind of got to a point where we're going, hang on a second, see so if we just asking politicians to change these rules that they generally benefit mm -hmm. from then is this going to actually happen yeah but that's why it's interesting you know movements like the voices for it movement like voices for india and that and i'm not you know i'm not saying you have to be an independent but those kinds of organizations which are motivating local activism that actually puts things such as transparency and you know a federal corruption commission at the top of their list as well as climate change I think have a flow on effect uh, in terms of the effect on the major parties as well. And again, it, it's not that everyone in the major parties is against this. It kind of, ironically, that also helps those within those parties who really have those same beliefs or are trying to push for those changes there. And so uh, I think that's having an interesting effect as well. So look, there's, you know, becoming involved, whether it's in the major parties or whether it's in another kind of independent group in your area is the key of it and making it clear to politicians that these are issues that are important to us. Yeah. Um, I think there's an, another really critical point here, Catherine, is that, which I think people aren't generally aware of, but what has happened in the political, in the, certainly in the major political parties now, Labor and Liberal and National, is that you advance as a politician, the more money you raise mm. and the more money you raise for other members of your faction. So if you eventually want to get into the ministry, you have to do that. And there's key people within the parties whose job is solely to, they're, they're elected politicians, but their job is really to go round and raise money for their factional um, candidates who they want to get into the ministry. And this is why uh, people like the Eddie Abeads of the world get so much power. And that's why I think when we're bringing in um, these laws that we want to see on transparency, we really want to know how much backbenchers, senators, members of the upper house who aren't necessarily even ministers are raising mm. in money terms. And I think that would actually... Uh, really pe peel away a layer of uh, a layer of secrecy on this stuff uh, that people aren't aware of. You don't know that your local member is in fact in fact a factional hack who's going around raising money uh, in order to determine cabinet positions. But you need to know that mm. because if that's what he, he or she is doing and not representing your interests, you want to be able to expose that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just one on media here. The guests have touched on corruption and how open and brazen it has become in this country, but it seems Australians and Australian media seem to downplay its effects. Why do you think that is? So um, I, I'm not so sure the media downplays it, but that's... Um... No, but it, it's interesting on this particular topic because it is. there's some structural difficulties there. So as we said, yeah. when you get, you know, firstly about depending on, you know, like about 50 to 60% of donations are basically hidden. And there's lots of different ways to get away with it. So you don't have to be actually upfront about it. Then there's a delay on when it's put out there. So 12 to 18 months later. So it, already there's a reason that it's less likely that media are going to write about that because often the effect has passed. It's like you're writing in the history and that's not something that, you know, news media necessarily goes to. 
but I guess you also, it also, I mean, it takes a lot of forensic analysis and obviously the cut back on funding for the media is a problem for that as well. You have the next factor that the media are involved in it. So, I mean, we had Channel 9 held a $10,000 head fundraiser for the Liberal Party. I mean, they're involved in lobbying and part of it as well. And also, often the targets of this complaint in this kind of structural money and politics sense are their advertisers as well. So there's a lot of reasons why, unless it gets to that full on, you know, this is corruption standard, it doesn't get covered. And this is part of the reason we wanted to do this thing and the big deal is we're not covering things that are necessarily against the law. As a matter of fact, Sam Dastiari sits there and talks us through it and goes, you know, yep, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. This is what we do. Is that illegal? It's not illegal. Mm. Is it, you know, is it, should it be? That's a different question. And that's the mm. point here is that a lot of this stuff isn't covered because it's not against the law, but it's also not covered because we only find out about it late and because the parties involved are very much, in, you know, and I think that's why the growth of independent media has also been quite positive in this um, aspect as well. Mm. Marion, what's, what's your take on that? Uh, yeah, I think that um, one is, you know, a lack of resources, yeah. especially in the bigger media companies now because, because everyone's so stretched and then you throw in a pandemic and, of course, the pandemic has blighted lives all over the world and certainly in Australia, but one of the things it has done is suck the oxygen out of the issue of political corruption and, uh, and political um, uh, abuses of power. And I think that's why someone like um, the New South Wales Premier can get away with getting up and saying, hey, well, that was pork barrelling and everyone does it, uh, like the way Scott Morrison has got away with both the sports rorts and the infamous car park uh, handouts. These things are real abuses of office, I think, and yet they haven't had uh, the, the impact that many thought they should have. And quite frankly, still need to have. And one of the reasons is I think that we are all, we all have our eye off the ball at the moment. And I think if politicians really want to get away with things in the lead up to this next election, it's going to be perfect timing for them. Yeah, exactly. Attention elsewhere. Um, this is more of a comment, but um, interesting. Lots of environmentalists learnt that 30 years, through 30 years of the forest wars, especially in Tasmania, um, and they got few gains because of the MP dependence and the club of Tassie politics, speaking to the market and influencing companies to shift their consumption and production and chain of supply was effective. So I think, you know, that comes back on uh, points that you both made. So mm. going about it uh, in, a, in a different way and, and exerting whatever pressure that you might have uh, in those yeah. ways. And Taz is another perfect example. I put aside the climate thing, the gambling regulations, they're <laughs> extraordinary. And and that it's amazing that, that example is very frustrating. We wanted to travel there, but couldn't because of COVID. But you have a very poor state where people are really, there's a massive you know, underclass in Tasmania, and yet they forego millions and millions of dollars of pokies revenue to companies that give enormous amount of money. And again, carrot and stick, give enormous amount of money to the parties, but also threaten enormous amount of campaigns during the elections as well. So it's, it's yeah. very frustrating. Yeah, I think one of the most egregious examples is the gambling industry in this. Mm. And in New South Wales, you go out to those socio-economically disadvantaged suburbs, Fairfield, <coughs> uh, places like that, the clubs and their and their tactics of you know opening all hours, free gifts at midnight to keep pensioners there to keep putting the money through the pokies. Uh, obviously, they're not happening now. But you, you know, as soon as we go back to to um, non lockdown times, that'll happen. And then at the high end of town, you know, we all look now aghast at the findings of the Crown inquiries into Crown Casino, both in New South Wales and in Melbourne, but and now in Perth. But at the time, I remember covering Crown for Four Corners, the only politician who would really stand up was Andrew Wilkie, you know, independent from Tasmania, 
knows about, as Craig said, the devastating impact of, of um, the gambling industry in his state. Um, he had guts, he would do it. But on the other hand, the Liberal and the Labor politicians were lining up to be at every glitzy opening that Crown did. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, it's a good example. Um, a number of people have mentioned uh, our, our independence, the way forward in some ways. Yeah. I mean, obviously we can't absolutely rely on that, but um, mm. uh, there's a few comments. Um, there's also this one, which is interesting. What role do you think there is specific education in our becoming a more robust uh, democracy? Uh, which is uh, kind of, you know what, in a, in a way, Craig, I think you're educating, aren't you? Not well, this is, I mean, we're, we're aiming Sorry. to, that's yeah. what we're trying to do with this, yeah. is, you know, and it's, it is, you know, it does have Christian, it is, there's a bit of humour in there, we're trying to get to that broader audience and get to younger people as well, particularly who I think it gets so affected by this. Um, it's interesting, the question of independence, because every electorate will be different. And one of the, one of the fascinating things about Voices for Indi was that they didn't start, they didn't start off as an organisation that was going to try and get somebody elected. They actually started out as a group that was assessing the concerns of the people in the community and then putting it to their elected member already at the time of Sophie Mirabella. And it kind of was at the lack of response to that that led them to go, well, shall we run somebody? Which has been quite fascinating to see the effect of that. But I think what where I think independents probably have an effect is that there's certain electorates in Australia at the moment where if you have a Labor member, the Liberal is not going to come in, or if a Liberal member and the Labor person is never going to come in. And therefore, having just that sense of contestability, having that sense that there is somebody who might challenge that, who is also coming from a different background where they aren't receiving large donations. I mean, I think it's fascinating that you look at Helen Haynes, who is an independent member for a rural seat, and yet she's passionate and talks about climate change. Isn't that interesting that a rural seat talks about climate change because we've been taught that that's not the case. Is it perhaps not that it's about being a rural seat? Is it perhaps the fact that generally those people come from parties that accept very large donations from coal companies and gas companies? Maybe that has an impact there. I don't know, just putting it out there. Uh, but yeah, I think independents have a, have a role in, again, improving the overall debate, whether or not you say, I'll never vote for an independent, I want to vote liberal the whole time. It's fine, it might still improve the standard of liberal candidate or the standard of debate that we have. Mm. Um, Again, I think in this time when the when the parties are so uh, finely balanced, you know, they can raise an independent can raise the bar. A, a member of a small party, you know, whether it's the Greens, whether it's the uh, you know Logic Party, whatever. But if they are putting ideas out there and raising the bar it can have a big impact on the other candidates. And certainly, you know, I'm from the seat of Wentworth and we found that, uh, that once uh, we had an independent candidate that was talking about issues like climate change, suddenly the debate was far more electrified both from the Labor candidate and from the Liberal candidate. So, you know, I think that's the other advantage if you're not forced into these um, just, you know, the, the, the two-party sort of stalemate and you can get someone in there to raise the standard of debate and, and put some heat on uh, in a, what, what seems like a safe seat, I think that makes a big difference. Yeah, fantastic. Um, somebody's just put up that the Whitlam Institute has a civics program for young Australians. So that, that might be of interest uh, to some. Um, a comment here about the gas led recovery, uh, which we haven't really touched on. Um, climate vandalism, I'm quoting uh, from, from our contributor here. Um, make it clear that fossil fuels must stay in the ground. Other you know, reports have made that clear. Despite all this, the Australian Parliament voted to grant 50 million to oil and gas companies. Uh, to yes, and both sides, again, both sides voted for that as well. Yeah. Again, so it's not, mm -hmm. this is yeah. really not a kind of liberal issue or whatever, it's, no. it's both sides. And it, it's interesting on the gas fuel recovery, I saw a fantastic comment, Lena. I should just always point out where things, other people do much better than us. Like Marion's book's much better than my coverage of this issue. But also I saw a tweet the other day, we cover the the, we'll see the National COVID Coordination Commission and the gas that recovery in the documentary. But there was a great tweet by Bruno Bryan from the ACCR that said, the thinking about, can't stop thinking about how government set up this COVID recovery commission and it did nothing.
thing about vaccine procurement or rollout or protecting aged care residents or essential workers, but it did recommend subsidising fossil fuel industries in a climate crisis. And that to me, it did, it kind of brought together a lot of the different thoughts and went, yes, isn't it fascinating that that's the first, literally it was, Scott Morrison announced that in the very early, early days. Yeah. Of it. He was he was announcing we're going to shut borders, and then the next day he was announcing the NCCC COVID Commission and the gas led recovery in this. And you think how that kind of to me highlights how how much a part of the system these people are, because they're there and it's like, well, what do we do? What do we got on the shelf already? Well, we've got this idea of you know, you know, let's let's should we use this? Should we use a gas led recovery? Great idea. That'll solve COVID. I mean, yeah, the old extraordinary. Yeah, um, never waste yeah, a crisis. <laughs> never, exactly. Yeah, that's right. Snap, yeah, exactly. Snap, Amazing. Yeah, from the jaws of, uh, yeah. of crisis. Um, so uh, just quickly, um, someone from Invi says, we have a long-term vision to encourage our community to, to demand a high standard of representation from all future MPs, as we, we know we may not always have an independent. Just a, a, a nice uh, comment there. Yeah. Um, and maybe we can sort of... Um, pull this together as our last one. What are the top three actions, I mean, you don't have to stick to three, um, we need to do to tip the government to set up the framework to get us on the right path to deal with climate change? We have in fact spoken about some of this, but I guess this isn't just um, us in individually um, because they, they're going to comment, it feels so well overwhelming that there are so many fundamental issues stopping us from progressing where we need to go. So I guess it's about what are some very broad um, areas that we we should be looking at to get that action taken i don't mind okay <laughs> Matt, okay, I'll start. sure um i guess uh, be active um so whether it be in a party or outside of a party pushing for change on climate but also on these underlying issues that are affecting so pushing for greater transparency for less influence of money in politics because what that does is that basically brings it back to the vote our vote and that's what we're trying to do is make our democratic system more democratic again. Uh, and that's the problem is we, as you said, all of the polling shows we care about this issue. The reason it doesn't have that impact is because we don't have a system that is really fundamentally democratic. There are problems with that. So be active on that front, make changes in your own life, I guess. But yeah, that's, that's the main one, I think, is, you know, campaign for whoever it is who will listen to you, whether it's family or friends, whether it be people in your electorate, whether it be people in your party. Again, I'm not saying this cannot be done through the major parties. One of the things that frustrates me about the climate debate in Australia is it's seen as a partisan issue. Yeah. In most of the world, yeah. this is not a partisan issue. In most of the world, conservative governments yeah. or left-wing governments lead on this issue. It is not left-right issue. The reason we see it as that issue in Australia is because it's been corrupted by this very debate and process that we've been talking about here. It's not that at all. Yeah. So, yeah. Get out there, change your minds. Well, well put. And Marion, um, you mentioned before, I just want to pick up um, as we finish off, um, the next 10 years is critical and you can see things moving. What what do you hope to see happen now? Let, let's be sort of um, optimistic. Yeah, uh, hope and also I think this is what people should be demanding of their both their local members and whatever financial institutions they're involved with. And I think it's pretty damn simple. You want a commitment from your local members that they actually do believe the science that we need to keep global warming within 1.5 degrees. And that means this decade, we do have to have a much bigger 2030 target to cut emissions in this country. And number two, that as both the International Energy Agency has said, along with a whole lot of other politicians, we need to have no new fossil fuel gas developments or coal developments unless they have a really established way to handle the emissions from those developments. And that basically means all these proposals currently on the table from Santos in the Beetaloo Basin, from uh, you know Imperial Energy, what Woodside's trying to do in Scarborough, basically that they should not go ahead unless they can demonstrate that they can handle the emissions coming from those projects. And I think 
you know that that will only happen when we have a political commitment in this in this country that we really do believe the science and we really do believe that we have to try and keep the temperature rise within this 1.5 degree um, target mm -hmm. and um, and that means real action it doesn't mean doing something in 2050 yeah um well put um throw away the loincloth basically yeah <laughs> exactly. let's, let's, let's get rid of that um oh no actually that takes me into not an image <laughs> uh, no we won't yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no it's sorry fine. sorry um look fantastic we've had such good uh, feedback i'm sorry we don't have time to go through all of these comments but a lot of really practical suggestions here as well um uh, looking at overseas looking at what we can do and so on so i think you know that makes me feel quite optimistic. Um, so I'm going to just finish up. Um, thank you so much, Craig and Marion, uh, for, for being here um, and for all, the, the, all that you're doing, because it does actually make such a difference. And I'm now going to hand over to Johnny to finish off. Thanks, Catherine. Unmute myself. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, I would, I'm Johnny Kennedy, in case you don't know, and on behalf of Susie, Liz, Trina, and myself at North Sydney Conversations, I'm delighted to say thank you to our speakers for an interesting and thought-provoking discussion. Uh, Catherine, thank you for skillfully guiding tonight's conversation. And Marion and Craig, thanks for your insights and for sharing a little about your book, Marion, and your film, Craig. Uh, it's been a pleasure to hear from you. And thank you to our attendees. We have three important details for you. First uh, is resources. We have a resources page that Susie will put up. And after these events, uh, we like to leave you with some resources, including some that can be helpful at a practical level. You may like to take a screenshot of that page that uh, we're sharing now. And there, some of those things you'll see, the first one is about uh, Craig's um, book, Big Deal, uh, sorry, documentary, Big Deal is Our Democracy for Sale. And I really like the fact you see the last bit of the line there that how we might work together to ensure our democracy is safeguarded from being sold. And I really liked um, Craig's point tonight. And I think, um, yeah, you can click on that link and uh, well, I'm not sure if we can, can we see it there, Craig? <laughs> Yeah, you can see the, uh, the, the trailer, the trailer there. There's also yeah. a website, makeitabigdeal.org, where it'll kind of it'll update you on information. Okay. Answer the questions we've had about where the hell we can watch it in lockdown. <laughs> okay, that's right. All right, we might update that as we get more details there. Thank you, Craig. And uh, secondly, Marion's book, The Carbon Club. Uh, it was great to hear a little bit more about that, Marion. And um, there's a link there to a ABC Radio National um, yeah, talk that Marion did with Paul Barclay. And so thank you, Marion. I'll really look forward to listening to that one. Uh, the Australian Federal Integrity Commission um, bill, if you'd like to hear more about that, Helen Haynes's bill, you can uh, click on that link and how to support that. Climate for Change, uh, that's a great organisation about how we can have um, more conversations with those close to us. Uh, gridlock, that is the Grattan Institute report. You can have a look at that. And importantly, the practical in the box there, what can we do um, writing to our, your federal MP? So the Climate for Change have great Zoom letter writing sessions. Uh, they're very, you're very welcome to join any of those. Uh, and the Centre for Public Integrity uh, provide quite a lot of um, resources on their uh, website if you'd like to find out more about that. Uh, so that's just resources. We have two more details. Um, secondly, Susie, uh, oh, and also we're going to put those resources on our web page um, so you can find them there later. Uh, secondly, Susie is going to be providing a survey link in the chat function now, uh, and we would appreciate any feedback you can share on that. You should be able to click on that link and if you can, you can uh, complete that survey maybe once we conclude here. Thirdly, is notice about our next event, which will see Zali Stegel MP and Heidi Lee, CEO of Beyond Zero Emissions, 
in conversation with impact investor Giles Kunisakera. I hope I said that right because I saw Giles in the talk tonight on Zoom tonight. Um, that event is in three weeks' time on Wednesday, the 15th of September. So please save the date. Uh, when you receive the invitation, which most of you should do, um, feel free to share it with others from our North Sydney electorate. We know that having discussions about these important issues with friends, family and colleagues is a great way to promote further thought on how we can ensure that our participation in this democracy aligns with our own values. And now to chat roulette. So we might say goodbye to our speakers. Thank you very, very much for joining us. It's been really great. Thank you, it's been everyone. a pleasure. Thank here. you so much. Cheers. And thank you to everyone who tuned in. Absolutely. Thank Active you. democracy, see? <laughs>